Uh, do me a favor. Um, turn in your Bibles, if you have them, or your app, to 1 Samuel 21. I'm really hot up here. And um, to turn to 1 Samuel 21. And then when you get there, put your finger there and turn over to the 56th Psalm. And while you're doing that, I just wanted to take a, a quick second to introduce myself, um, kind of boast on your pastor just for a second. Um, my name is John Abner. Uh, I am uh, in the construction industry. I work for the city of Mount Dora. Um, I am... Uh, a former youth pastor, former pastor, um, and about a year and a half ago, two years ago, uh, coming off of uh, losing six family members, um, the last one being a suicide, uh, I disappeared. And, um, and, and the reason I disappeared is because uh, I, I don't care if people hate me because of Jesus, but I don't want them to hate Jesus because of me. And so uh, I, I needed a little bit of time uh, to, to heal. And uh, over that time, there's been one or two, maybe three people that, um, that really have been relentlessly on me uh, to, to not stop sharing and teaching and, and having opportunities to, to do what um, I, I think I was created to do, and that's to teach the Word of God. One of those men is Moses, and I'm thankful for him um, for, for the phone calls. Even when I ignore them, he doesn't get angry at me. He stays on me, chases me through town, through Target, at Walmart. We, I see him, and, and um, I am thankful for his friendship and for his encouragement and just for um, believing in me. Um, in the midst of all of this, so yeah. thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to dive into the Word. I'm going to share a little bit out of, of what I've learned over the last year and a half, two years, and um, ultimately my goal uh, tonight is one for, uh, if there's anyone here, if you don't, if you've never seen the need for a Savior, um, my prayer is that tonight is the night. Um, but secondly, I would love nothing more than for you to fall in love with the Word of God in a way that you never expected possible. Um, and uh, this comes from a, a college dropout, a seminary dropout, a guy that barely graduated high school that uh, uh, can read but doesn't remember what he reads um, started out my relationship with the Word with my girlfriend at the time reading to me um, a, a teenage Bible, even though I was an, a, a grown man. And, and she's my wife now, and uh, so that is awesome. Uh, thankful for that. But um, I, uh, I, I, I say that to say uh, for you, for you to, to know that um, uh, when you study the Bible, you're never alone. The author of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, dwells inside of you. And so the one who inspired the men and women to write the words that you read is with you when you're reading them. Yeah. And if you'll read and if you'll continue to seek him through your word, I promise eventually things will start to jump off the pages and you'll start to understand and see things that you never thought possible. And I promise you that there are things that God wants to inject into your life that are never, ever, ever going to come from me or Moses or anybody that you see on TV or anybody that you see on Friday, Saturday, Sunday or online. There are things that God wants to, to show you in an intimate relationship with you that is never going to come unless you have a relationship with the word of God. God. That's right. So let's do this and, and let's see what happens. And, and I'm super excited. So the 56th Psalm is where we're starting. I'm going to read the entire thing and then we're going to talk about it for a second. So it says this. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So follow along in, in your Bible or on the screen. It says, be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What, what can flesh do to me? All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as uh, they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape 
In wrath cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before you, God, in the light of life. Father, I thank you so much tonight for this opportunity, for this moment that we have together. I pray, Lord, that uh, your word tonight would go forth on fertile soil. I ask God that uh, when we leave here, that we wouldn't be forgetful hearers, but instead that that, that that seed would take root in our lives. It would change us forever. And Father God, I pray that it would produce fruit, Lord, and fruit that remains. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. And so let me give you a little bit of backstory to what's going on when David is writing this song uh, that we call the 56th Psalm to the Lord. Um, uh, it's written during a time when uh, the Philistines have seized David um, in a place called Gath. And, and we're going to see that in, in 1 Samuel 21. Just before 1 Samuel 21 in chapter 20, uh, Saul, the king of Israel, makes this promise that he and all of his resources are going to make sure that David is dead. They're going to kill him. They're going to make sure it happens. David freaks out and he flees. And so we get to 1 Samuel chapter 21. Uh, David comes to a town called Nob. Um, in that town, he comes to a priest, a man of God, Ahimelech. Ahimelech gives David food, and he gives him a weapon, and he sends him on his way. So we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 10. This is what happens, uh, verses 10 through 15. David rose and he fled that day from Saul. He went to Achish, uh, uh, the king of Gath, and the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land that they sang about, that they danced about? Saul has struck down his thousands, but David his ten thousands? So David hears this, and it, it resonates with him. And, and it says there in verse 12 that he took these words to heart, and he was afraid because he thought that the king was going to kill him. And so he changes his behavior, and he pretends to be insane uh, in their hands, and he made marks on the doors of the gate. He left spittle run down his beard, so he's like drooling all over himself. He's thrashing around. And then Akish said to his servants, this man is mad. Why have you brought him to me? Don't I, do I have a, a, a lack of madmen that you've brought this fellow to behave like this in my presence? Uh, do you want this guy to come into my house? And so now understand what's happened. David flees to Gath, which, by the way, is the home to Goliath that David killed back in 1 Samuel 17. He's carrying Goliath's sword that the man of God thought would be a good idea to give him on his way to this town. He's not expecting a welcome party. He knows it's not good, but he is so desperate to get away from Saul that he's willing to go to the last place on earth that Saul would ever look for him, even if it means what he encountered. Upon them seizing him, he pretends to act like he's insane, which apparently works. I think things haven't changed much. Like, <laughs> and he's running from a king to a land of a giant that he killed, carrying his weapon. Wow. He's not having a good day. He's, he's overwhelmed. So my first question, maybe right now or, or maybe you're, you're coming out of it or you can remember a moment that you were overwhelmed. You ever been overwhelmed? I mean, 
I've never run from the king of a land to the hometown of a giant that I killed. But I've been overwhelmed. And with that background, think about the words of the 56th Psalm. A psalm that describes a man that is, is under great pressure. He says, he says, men are trampling on me. They're oppressing me. They're, they're trying to injure me. Three times in the 56th Psalm, David says, all day long. It's like he's saying, God, I can't even take a breath. I, I don't know what to do. First it was Saul, and then it was the Philistines, and now it's this. It's one thing after another. I know you've felt that way before. Yes. And you might be feeling that way right now. Yes. Overwhelmed. Maybe it's one big thing. Maybe it's a bunch of little things. Maybe it's a bunch of big things. But you're just like, God, could I just catch a break? Could I just rest? I'm guessing that there are people in this room tonight that when you got up this morning, you're like, I just need a break. I need a chance to recover. It's what David is saying when he starts out this song. In verse 1, he says, be gracious to me, O God. Man tramples me. The attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample me all day long. Verse 5 and 6, he says it, all day long they injure my cause. Their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps. They're waiting for my, for my life. Have you ever been opposed? Like people just standing against you everywhere you go. That's the language that David is using in the 56th Psalm. He says, they're trampling on me. Gracious God, they're thinking evil thoughts about me. They're lurking, just waiting. We don't know of a physical attack that's happened yet, but verbal battles and plots for sure. Just waiting to go after this man's life. Some translations uh, in the 56th Psalm use the word slander. Your name ever been slandered? And particularly when I'm reading this, I'm thinking slander when you've done nothing wrong? When there was no, no intent for hurt or harm, but, but people just have bad things to say when your name comes up and, and, and they just can't take your name out of their mouth? You ever just want to tell somebody, like, take my name out of your mouth? Just do that, please. Yeah. That's slander. Unjustly attacked by others. People making plots to, to ruin you. Have you ever felt alone? At this moment, when David is writing the 56th Psalm, he's alone. Now later, a chapter later, 100 men come to surround him in a cave and be there for him. That, that, that's the, the hope that we have. But you felt alone. Maybe, like, literally you've been alone. Nobody around. Or maybe even worse than being alone physically is being surrounded by people yet feeling alone. Feeling misunderstood, like, like nobody has any idea what it's like to walk in your shoes. No one understands. And then there's this key word in the 56th Psalm. Have you ever been afraid? David says uh, three times, he says, when I'm afraid. It's the same word that he uses back in 1 Samuel 21 that, that he felt when the king seized him. Like there, there was a fear for his life. And it's interesting, at the end of verse 4 and the end of verse 11 in the 56th Psalm, David says, what can flesh do to me? What can, what can man do to me? 
And they're rhetorical questions, but the reality is the answer seems to be flesh and man can do a whole lot to you. Either from their presence or their lack thereof. From the things that they say or the things that they do. Man can attack, can oppose, can injure, can threaten, and even kill you. That's what I appreciate about the 56th Psalm. It's real. It's not just like this uh, superficial religiosity that ignores life's reality. I can remember, uh, I must say this lightly, so forgive me if it offends you. I can remember being at moments in my life where I am hurting and I am just wishing and hoping for a, a friend, for someone to come alongside, for someone to encourage, and for uh, those that I thought might be there, what I got was, I'll pray for you. Now, we're going to talk about this in a second. But, hear me, there comes a time when, yes, thank you, I covet your prayers, but can we just hang out for a minute? Did you just like tell me that you love me, that you haven't forgotten me, just encourage me a bit? Like, I want the prayers, I do. But, but sometimes it feels a little superficial, right? So, I mean, your prayers are going to go a long way to helping the Bahamas recover. $100 would help a lot, too. So sometimes there's got to be meat and action and giving of ourselves Behind the religion. David is running for his life. He's pursued by his enemies on each side. And he's afraid. He's scared. He doesn't know what's going to happen next. And it's a fear that I know every single one of us are familiar with. It's frightening. What people can do to us. People can slander you. People can ruin your reputation. People can get you fired from a job. People um, can be unfaithful to you. People can harm you physically. People that you love can abuse you. They can harm you. They can hurt you in different ways. And it's not just people, but circumstances can do that to you as well. Circumstances can come to you that you have no control over. And I'm not trying to be depressing, but real. These are things that every single one of us have either dealt with or dealing with or you better be sure are going to deal with. David is experiencing his worst nightmare. And so the question that we have to, to, to ask is how does David deal with this real fear in the midst of this world that we live in, a fear that we're all familiar with? And the answer, and it's the most poignant part of this psalm. It's really the, the, the crux of this chapter. In verses 3 and 4, David says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. And then he says this. He says, I shall not be afraid. What can man, what can flesh do to me? Love the transition that takes place here. If you put the beginning of verse 3 with the middle of verse 4, David says, when I'm afraid, I shall not be afraid. What happens? What happens between when I'm afraid, I shall not be afraid? I put my trust 
in you, God. I put my trust in you, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. The first thing that David does when he is oppressed, when man is trampling him, when he's afraid, when he's alone, when people are opposing him, the thing that he does is he puts his trust in God. He looks to him. He cries out, and this must be our first reaction when we're overwhelmed, when we're opposed, when we're alone, when we're afraid. We must cry out to God. And this is what I was talking about, the prayer before. Uh, uh, This must be our first reaction. Prayer is not a last resort. It's a first resort. And so when we see people that are hurting or we see consequences that are hurting, yes, we pray for them. And when we're done praying, then we go. Then we help. Then we give of ourselves. The prayer ought to be a a no-brainer. The approach isn't when all else fails, pray. The approach is pray first. This is huge. Then whatever else. When we're faced with all that overwhelms, when we're faced with those that oppose, with loneliness, with fear, it's easy for us to focus on that which overwhelms us. But here's the problem if we do that. The more we look at that which overwhelms us, the more overwhelming it gets. In the same way, the more that we think about those who oppose us, the more oppressive they become. You're thinking about the person that hurt you. You know how much the person that hurt you is thinking about you? Zilch. And when we think about how much they hurt you, all that they are doing is hurting us more and we're allowing them to. The more we dwell on our loneliness, the more lonely we feel. The more we contemplate our fears, the more real our fears become. I used to have an awesome opportunity to deal with young people all the time, and uh, all kinds of little knuckleheads running everywhere. And they all wanted to, to have significant others. They wanted boyfriends and they wanted girlfriends. And, and I can remember uh, telling people that the best thing you can do is stop looking. Because I promise you, the more you try, the less chance you got. And the more we focus on these things, the bigger they become. So what is the antidote? Instead of looking at them, look at him. See your circumstances in light of his character. And that's what I want you to see. The first thing that we do is we put our trust in the character of God. You got to see how important the object of our faith is here. We're not talking about just moving from fear to faith and and the object doesn't matter. Because the object is is real. It's why two years, a year and a half later, I'm still talking about the, the, the struggles. They're real. They still hurt just as much. Now, I'm going to have some family with me tomorrow, some loved ones when I have opportunity to share with you again. And, and it's even more personal for them. And, and there's not a day that goes by that that, that that burden isn't there. But the way that we deal with that hurt isn't by putting our, our eyes and our time on that hurt. That's how the world copes with fear. The world says, put faith in yourself. You'll get through it. Or put faith in the circumstances. It'll get better. Or put your faith in those people. They'll change. How many of you learned that one the hard way? But that's not where David puts his faith. He doesn't put his faith in himself. He doesn't put his faith in his circumstances. He doesn't put his faith. Ah, maybe Saul changed his mind. He puts his faith in God. His trust in the character of God. Because follow this. He is the omnipotent, the all-powerful God. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. It's this this, um, uh, really powerful scripture where Jesus says, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. All is a numerical phrase. It means 100%. 
And so Jesus says, 100% of authority has been given to me. I'm not a mathematician, but I understand that that leaves zero left over. Satan has zero authority in your life. People have zero authority in your life. Circumstances have zero authority in your life because Jesus has already taken all the authority. It's all his. The only way that Satan and people and circumstances have effect over you is if you allow it to. If you give it to it. If you give it to him. If you give it to them. Jesus already said, no, I've already got it all. Quit giving them that power. Quit giving them that ability because I'm all powerful. Nine different times in 56 Psalms, 13 verses, nine different times, David refers uh, to God using the term Elohim. It's it's in in the Old Testament when you see God, capital G, O-D, is the, the word Elohim. It's the most common name for God in the scripture, and it refers to his authority and power as creator, as sustainer over everything in the world. And David is just crying out, Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. In Elohim I trust. In the creator I trust. In the sustainer I trust. In the one that holds all of this in his hands, I trust. What can flesh do to me? In God I trust. We've already said what man or ultimately what the world can do to us. It's a lot. But... It's not that much when put in comparison to what God can do for you. It it begins to, to shrink. It's like the basis for our fear is what man can do to us, but our basis for faith is what God can and will do for us. And when we compare the two, There's really no comparison. David is echoing here what we see later in Romans 8. If God is for me, who could be against me? It's like what Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. He says he's getting ready to send them out like, like sheep to the wolves. And he says, listen, he says, don't be afraid. And he tells them it for a reason. He tells them over and over and over again, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. I think like three times in Matthew 10, he says, don't be afraid. And he says it because man can do a lot of things to him, even kill him. And we know later that he does, that they do. You just study the history of the disciples and those mighty men and women of God that came after Jesus and, and the way that they were killed and the, the martyrs uh, that they were. Yes, man can do a, a lot. God alone has the power and authority, he says in Matthew 10, to save your soul. So it doesn't matter. Yes, he may kill you, but God has saved you for all eternity. He is all powerful over all, over uh, man. Man is flesh, but God is God. And God is the merciful God. God is the powerful God. And not only is this, not only is he powerful God, but he is merciful in our time of need. And so this is where it gets really good. Like, yes, God, yay, you have all the power. My situation still is really, really crappy. And so can we work something out? (laughs) And so David opens up this song by saying what? Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me. You know why he says that? Because he knows that this powerful God delights in showing mercy to the overwhelmed. He delights in lightening that burden and taking that yoke off of our shoulders. So David cries out for grace. He cries out for unmerited, much-needed mercy. I was teaching my four-year-old. She's five now, but she was four at the time. I was teaching her about the game Mercy. 
Remember that when we were kids and you lock hands with someone and you would, you would, uh, you know, push it back and forth until someone hurt so bad that they'd say mercy. Picture David saying, I can't take no more mercy. Mercy, God. You're the only one I know that could provide mercy in the midst. Hear this. All of you that are overwhelmed or opposed tonight. All of you that feel alone or feel afraid. The all-powerful God of the universe is an endless source of grace to those that trust him. He's the one that says in 1 Peter to cast your cares upon me because I care for you. And, and remember who we're talking about, fishermen, in this term, casting is like tossing it. And so when he says cast, he's like, just throw it over here. Just get it off because I care about you. And then one of the most beautiful verses in this particular uh, song, verse 8 He says, you have kept count of my tossings. You've put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? What a picture. David knows that the one that he's praying to is the God that sees and hears and knows and remembers our suffering. Think about all of those nights that you've tossed around yeah. in bed yeah. because you couldn't sleep. David says, God, you've been counting them. One, two. Those hours that you've spent crying. The imagery here is, is in a, a, a dry Israel where they would take precious liquids and they would save them in bottles, perfumes, and water, milk, oil. David says, God, you've done that with my tears because they're precious. You remember them. They're in your book, God. You remember my hurts. Just think, overwhelmed and burdened and afraid and alone, the God of the universe has never missed a moment that you've tossed back and forth in your hurts. He hears every single cry, and he records, and he remembers, and he never forgets all of these things. The all-powerful God is not indifferent towards you. Like, ah, you know, there she is crying again. No. He sees it. He hears it. And he cares for you in the midst of your suffering. And that's when we're tempted to say, all well and good, God, I'm glad that you care, but what are you doing? Yes. But here's the beauty of the verse. Yes. David says, just a breath later, he says, then my enemies. You don't think God can do anything about your sufferings? David says, then my enemies will turn back in the day in which I call. And he repeats this phrase, whose word I praise. And God's whose word I praise. And the Lord whose word I praise. And God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And then in faith he says, I must perform my vows to you, O God. So the thing that I appreciate about David is that he doesn't forget who he is even in the midst of his trial. And, and I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that there have been moments over the last couple of years I forgot who I was. 
And so my, my, my request would be, please be patient because he's not finished with me yet. And then David says this. He says, I will render thank offerings before you, God, for you have delivered my soul from death, my feet from falling, that I might follow uh, or that I might walk before God in the light of life. Now get this. David while he is in Gath, where King Saul and his armies are on his heels, in the midst of the land in which the giant that he killed is from, arrested and seized by a man that could put him to death with just a hint of that's what he wants. David says, God, I'm thankful that you're getting me out of this. Why? Because he remembered who he was praying to. He's the God who delivers us from darkness to death. He delivers our soul from death. He keeps our feet from falling. He is the powerful God that sees our tears. And David remembers this and he says, God, I know that you know my pain. And though my enemies are only steps away from me and there is trouble that is following me, your power will keep my feet from falling. He's the God that delivers us from darkness to light, darkness to death. And he is the God that gives light to life. And so in this psalm, although it is painting at the beginning a very bleak picture of being overwhelmed and overtaken by trouble, David ends up by saying, God, I am thankful that you are the light of this life. We can put our trust in the character of God. But here's where it gets really tricky, and this is where it involves us. Because we can come into a service and we can feel all good and we can get the goosebumps and we can do all that stuff and say, you know what, I'm ready to attack hell with a water pistol. (laughs) But we have to, we have to lift our heart to the word of God. We have to. Um, I am thankful for the opportunity to be spoon-fed by other men and women of God. I am even more thankful that I am a big boy and I can feed myself. I have two children. They were able to feed themselves at like two And so when people say, I don't go there because I'm not being fed there, that speaks speaks more of their infancy than it does the place that they're not being fed. (laughs) David puts his trust in the character of God, but right in the middle of that, he says, in God whose word I praise. He says the same thing later in verse 9. He says, in God whose word I praise Um, uh, He he says uh, this time, though, he uses the covenant name for the Lord, Lord Yahweh. Uh, in In the Old Testament, it would be all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R. Capital D, uh, three times, though, David says that he praises the word of God. And so clearly, God's word is fundamental in us moving from fear to faith. And not just reading God's word or knowing God's word, but praising God's word. And that might feel a little bit awkward to you, um, but David says it a bunch, so I'm going with it. But we praise it, um, first of all, because his word is supreme, that that there's nothing uh, uh, above it. Um, 
I get down with a lot of uh, different denominations, but the minute that people stop, start adding words to this, I check out. I'm gone. Uh, because it's supreme over everything. 119th Psalm, verse 48 says, I will lift up my hand towards your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. He says a little bit later in the 119th Psalm, verse 120, he says, my soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. Later on, he says in 138th Psalm, verse 2, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. That whole name that's above all names, God says, yeah, I put my word right next to it. Which means trusting in God in the midst of our despair means that we must trust in his word. Because not only is his word supreme, but it's sure. It's true. Many commentators believe that, that David's reference to the word of God is, um, is not just a general reference to his word as a whole, but, but more specifically to promises that God made over David. You guys remember that time back in 1 Samuel chapter 16 um, when David was anointed king yes. by decree of God's word <laughs> through the, the, uh, the man of God? And so here David is fleeing for his life. He's running and acting a fool. He's drooling all over himself, carrying around Goliath's sword. He's tempted to think, well, that's it. It's over for me. But what happens? He remembers the promise of God. And when he remembers the promise of God, he decides, I'm going to stand on it. And when he decides to stand on it, he praises it. He says, he says these guys can't kill me. God made a promise to me. That's right. There's nothing that these guys can do to me. The word is true. I've still got hope, even though it looks like there's no hope. Because if that word is true, then I know I've got to get out of this darkness back into life. I know that I'm going to get free from this thing. Yes. And this is where we'd be tempted to say, well, John, no man of God has ever come to me and told me that I am going to be the king over the land when I was out taking care of the sheep um, out uh, in the pasture. And I, I was, <laughs> uh, if that happened to you, come talk to me afterwards, and, and uh, I, I want to hang out with you. Um, but he hasn't. It hasn't happened. If you think it did, it didn't. But we've got something better than David. Yes. We've got 66 books right. that are filled with countless promises that God is with us and he is for us and he promises us peace and he promises us comfort and he promises us guidance and grace. He promises to love and to lead us. He promises that uh, he delights in us and that he's worthy of our praise. We've got something that David didn't even have. And it's true. And it's sure. And it's supreme. And hear me. It's sufficient. It's enough. The word of God is enough. In the midst of your troubles and your hurts and your fears and your loneliness, it's not what we need, it's all we need. If only we believed this. Again, like, like this, this is as much for me as it is for you. I've never preached a, a sermon that wasn't an overflow of, of my issues. This is all I need. I think back in Numbers 13 and 14, um, God's people, they, they come to the edge of the promised land and uh, they send spies in to scout out the land. And, uh, and, and most of the spies come back afraid and they say, nope, <laughs> we're out. We can't take it. 
They're too big. They're too strong. They're too powerful. They are going to kill us. We can't do it. You know what happens? Those spies, they win the day. They, they convince the people that the land that God promised them was unattainable. But a little bit later, what happens? Caleb and Joshua, they stand up and they say, no, 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 hold, hold on. Yeah, they're, they're really big. And they're really powerful. But do you remember who made us the promise? Could we think about that for a second? Because they're not too big. They're not too powerful for the one that made us the promise. They trusted in the character of God, the word of God, the word that God had spoken that said, this land is yours. Finished. Nothing else, the circumstances after that doesn't matter because Caleb and Joshua believed that if God settled it or if God said it, it settled it. And we've got to believe that in our situation, in our circumstances. But if God has said it, it settles it. God has spoken his word bigger than everything, sufficient, all that we need to bring us from darkness into light. Now, you can't lift your heart to his word if you don't know his word. I'll just leave that there. That's why we read the Bible. And I know that it's not easy. Believe me, I know it's not easy. There are countless days that I just try to get to the end so I can put a check on the paper. I'm like, yep, I did it, God. And then there's days that I can't get out of one sentence because God just wrecks me yes. with a word. That's why we read the Bible. Yes. Last thing, let's land the plane. Place your hope in the Son of God. David puts his trust in the character of God. He lifts his heart to the word of God. But we know this. We know that Psalm 56 doesn't end at verse 13. Um, for with it and all of Scripture point to someone greater. The one in whom Moses said, in the, it says of Moses in the book of Hebrews that the riches of Egypt were nothing compared to the glory of Christ. It talked about Moses and Jesus? Yes, it does. Everything points to someone greater, Jesus. The center of all scripture there from the beginning of Genesis all the way through the center of the Bible, and when you are overwhelmed or opposed or alone or afraid, place your hope in the Son of God. Yes. Put your trust in Christ. He knows your sin. He knows your suffering, and he longs to save you. Yes. Just waiting for that moment that you say, Yes, I believe. Save me. And not only does he long to save you, but he longs to show you mercy and to raise you up to new life with him so that you never, ever, ever have to be afraid again. So that you never, ever, ever have to feel alone. Because in him, you can trust. Let me read this last passage, Romans 8, verse 31. This is what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he's the one who was raised and who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height, depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hear me this evening. I've said everything else was just filler to say this. Because I, I couldn't come and, and just say one sentence. <laughs> so I said all of that other stuff just to say this. If God has saved you in Christ Jesus from death, hell, and the devil, then what circumstances in this world can you not trust him in? But this is what we allow to happen. Yes, he saved me from hell. Yes, he saved me from eternity uh, separated from him. But these people are really, really mean, God. <laughs> what? If he has saved us from all of that, there is nothing that will ever happen in this life that he's not bigger than. You do not have to fear. Say this with me. In him I trust. What can this world do to me? Let's say it again. In him I trust. What can this world do to me? Father God, you're good. I thank you for this opportunity to be here with these, your children. I just pray, God, that if any of them here tonight um, haven't said yes to you, that, that this would be a moment where they say, you know what, this is something I need to think about again. And I, I ask, God, that, um, that you would open their eyes to the need of a Savior of all the miracles that you've ever done throughout all eternity, the greatest is to open a blind eye to see you. And Lord, after they've said yes to you, I pray, Lord, that they would feel and know and understand your grace and your mercy. And Lord, even in the, some of them here tonight are facing great distress, hurt, pain. Some of it has, has, has been with them for years. I ask you tonight, God, that when they look at those hurts and those fears and those pains, and they compare them to your power and your love, that those things would be overshadowed with your mercy and your Lord, I pray that those things that used to hold us back would be the very reason that we proclaim your name boldly in Lake County, in Central Florida, and to the ends of the earth. Because we trust you, Jesus. I love you and I thank you for this night. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> this, uh, don't judge me when I say this. There's not too many things more beautiful than the passion of a regular dude. You know what I mean? You didn't see a uh, fancy seminary degree up there, did you? 
It's the passionate plea of a Home Depot guy. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things I really enjoyed about tonight's message is, um, I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but he really undergirded who we are here at Revolution Church, um, just really exalting and lifting up the value of God's Word. And I think that the world really needs that. The Bible has fallen on rough times in our country and around the world, and people think that they need to come up with something new. I've heard this said before, if you come to church and hear something new, you probably need to leave, okay? God's Word stands forever. It's perfect, it's powerful, it's true, and it's what we need. And so thank you for, for just um, not letting us really focus on you. Um, quite often while he was up speaking, I didn't even remember that he was up there, and that's, what, that's the job of a preacher, and he did a great job. So um, i got to ask you guys a question, just honest. How many people felt like God spoke to them tonight? Raise their hand. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> okay, so, so um, I just want to boldly ask you, I don't want to be afraid, we're going to take our offering right now. 